Uh, yeah, that won't do. Uh, how about this one? Um, no. I'll tell you what, I'll just start the podcast. Hello, welcome back to Andrew Culture's podcast. I called it that because that's my name. Well, it's not my name, but I won't kind of dwell on that too much. I've got somebody interesting to speak to today, and he has several names as well. I know him as Wibby, which I'm saying straight up right at the start, because I will probably refer to Wibby and call my guest Wibby. But it's not your name, is it? Uh, no, my real name is Alex. But? I haven't been called Alex since I was six months old. So uh, You remember being six months old? No, I can remember, but my parents have told me basically they uh, called me Alex. My full name is Alexander William George. Mm-hmm. It's like the most regal name ever. <laughs> it's very <laughs> How was I not a king or something? I don't know. Um, but they basically, after like six months, my mum decided she didn't like the name she had given me. And my big brother, Tim, used to pronounce my name, Alexander Wibby George. <laughs> and then so basically Wibby stuck and I was Wibby for basically... It proper stuck because that is still when, when I... When I um, so Wibby and I have known each other for, for quite a while, but Wibby also knows my sister. Jessica, and we all, we all went to the same high school, though I'm a bit older than a bit older. you guys. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, we still refer to Wibby, and we, we all know who we're talking about, and, you know, I've, I've been in bands with people who you've been in bands with, but so it's clearly a name that stuck pretty well. Yeah, literally, uh, apart from maybe one of my grandparents, she would, she occasionally would still call me, with, it would still call me Alex, but otherwise, even like school, everything like Wibby and then Wibs, and I've basically been Wibby or Wibs for the like the last. I don't know what you're like, but if, if people twenty odd years, no, thirty for thirty five years, I forget how old I am. You're not thirty five. Thirty six. Are, are you really? See, oh, I'm not man. not going to deliberately insult you. But I thought you were a lot closer to my age. I'm forty four. No. So I know that this this is kind of going off track. It's a problem with uh, problem with the Ipswich music scene, I think, and it? We all just hang out and you kind of everything. Everyone's the same age. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so this this podcast so far has had a loose theme of transformation, and uh, having a little chat before I pressed record, I kind of thought I had a quite a definite idea about which way this was going to go. But I think it's going to go a different way. But I still think you've got a very interesting story. So. We both went to the same school, although I think I must have left by the time you were there. So I reckon, yeah. So we must w- have done. We won't dwell too much on that. <laughs> um, I think my sister, my little sister, was still paying the price for my misadventures <laughs> when I was at school when she was there. But so when you left school, did you have a clear? See, I've not revealed what Wibby does yet, so we're going to leave that. But did you have a clear mission? Did you have a clear I, thing? No. When I left, school, I left uh, sick form after a year because I didn't get on with Mr. Jennings very much, who was the head of sick form. Um, and I went travelling in to around New Zealand for eight months. Like, literally. Like, 17, 16? Yeah, 17 I went. Well, by yourself? Yeah, I had, my dad's got some fr- uh, family, like, an, like, old, old friends, so I went and stayed with them for, uh, like, three months, and then I spent five months travelling. That's fairly badass at that age. Well, yeah, I just had to do something. <laughs> I left sick form, so I was like... I think, I think my dad said, you can join the army or you can go travelling. <laughs> I was like, I'm going travelling. Join the army? Yeah, basically. I've got a long family history of the army as oh, well. Oh, right, so, okay. It wasn't uh, just a random No, thing. no. It's like, you go and join the engineers because like your grandfather. Um, and so instead I went travelling. And so I came back and was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe I'll be a painter and a decorator because I quite I did a bit when I was out there. And then so I kind of took a painting and decorating. And then I got laid off from that one Christmas. And then I had a mate who or a mate's girlfriend i should say i guess we would we would get the train in from sax mundum to ipswich mm-hmm. for um college and she's like why don't you come do nursing with me come be a nurse because uh they pay you six grand a year to do it you haven't got to pay it back and do you know what i mean you get a qualification in my head i was like well i want to go and live in new zealand so mm-hmm. if i get a nursing qualification i'm sorted i can go work oh, go yeah, and live out you'd, there you'd have the points so yeah. to get in wouldn't you and then so that's what i did I signed up and i thought six grand a year i could buy a Le- gibson les paul with that sweet uh, i didn't actually ever buy a gibson les paul but i did get given one uh, which was as a birthday present which was quite nice but um so i did my nursing and from 2004 till 2012 ish 
Oh, don't ask me. 12, I think. Memory's not good enough to remember. Well, no, probably 2014. I had a couple of off years because I went and became ski and snowboard instructor in that time as well. I've forgotten that. <laughs> yeah. I literally, I've, like, I've done everything. Um, so I did spend three years being doing ski and snowboarding instructing too, um, in, in, while still a, a nurse. Um, and then in 2014, I went to India. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. You're Stop there. racing through the story here. So you said... Um, before Mike went on that you fell into nursing I think you've kind of fairly well explained that I just think it's quite interesting because I've got friends who are nurses or family members who are nurses and it does seem to fall into two groups it falls into the people who were pretty much knew they were going to be a nurse from a very young age very passionate about it and my, my sister-in-law very much falls into that into that category and then there seems to be a lot of people who never planned to I, I was nearly a I was going to say I think I remember you saying at one point you were nearly a nurse you've done some of your training didn't I you? was on the ND so I did BTEC ND yeah. which the next step was Project 2000 yeah, as it yeah. was then so I was Project 2000 I only did that because at high school careers officer we went to Thomas Mills but yeah. I'm not going to like shit on anyone <laughs> who worked there but we went to Thomas Mills I, was, I had a happy time uh, had a lot of fun um, but <laughs> careers office there they were like what do you want to do when you leave school I was like, I'm, I'm going to be a musician and they're like no no really what are you going to do I'm, like, I'm going to be a musician they're like look go do nursing <laughs> <laughs> similar <laughs> and I, still, I still don't know how I, I think I think it's kind of cool that kids now can go study to be a musician that, that's yeah, a, yeah. a big difference but I, I didn't I didn't go through with it for for various reasons so you what sort of what do you with nursing I can't remember it's been so long do you choose what type of nursing Not, well you there's your... just adult P or like mental health or mm. there was a learning disc course when I did mine as well but that's finished now I think I don't think they run that anymore um because I seemed to get every placement, I was always geriatrics. So. Yeah, I mean, I so I had a few, but essentially it was like general adult nursing, and then you get a placement on whatever ward comes up mm. type thing. So I was a coronary care nurse for the first, like, four-ish years. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, 28. I love uh, the fact you keep asking me. <laughs> it's more just like we're trying to make the old grey matter catch up. I kind of can't believe we're 2020. Uh, so 2008, 2012-ish, I was coronary care. And then, or maybe 2011. I don't know. Who cares? It's not that important. <laughs> There's no one taking notes. It's really not important. And then from there, I went and did my ski and snowboarding sort of on and off. So I'd go for six months, come back, nurse for six months, go out for six months, come back. So months. does being a nurse kind of suit that flexibility quite well? Not really. Well, um, not having a f- proper job as such. But so I managed to get like four and a half, five months off. I saved all my annual leave and then took like... Um, a bunch of unpaid leave for my first trip and then when I came back I came back to my job for six months and then I quit so the same same role you came back to the same I always assumed that you, you kind of went came back and because there was a so lack on, of nurses so on that I managed to keep my same role but then when I came back the second time I then just worked on the bank so like I worked on any it's like the like an in-house agency essentially okay. so I just worked on any ward any like anywhere that needed nurse that day you would like essentially so get sent considering it wasn't really part of your career plan you did it for quite a long time yeah i still i've still been nursing up until just recently like not really like like one day a fortnight type thing because obviously as we said pre if you're going to be a nurse you have to keep your registration valid you've got to do mm. a certain amount of hours a certain amount of training so i have done that so i'm still doing some nursing but um yeah, I kind of did it full time from for like uh, eight years. So that's seven years, that's not seven that's years. not something you just stumble into and think you might as well stick with it. You must. Yeah, have, but it pays quite well. Do you know what I mean reasonably well? I'm wanting like, you to tell me you did. You've discovered a passion for some parts. Like no, I mean I loved it. Like I loved the teamwork. I mean when we go into what I do now and whatever else, like you know when you work alone, like you definitely miss having a team around you and 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 working with nurses and doctors like the humor's pretty dark it's pretty (laughs) pretty hilarious like you know you see some weird horrible wonderful crazy disgusting things but you kind of have a whole team around you that you like bond with those things over which is like and i honestly don't think you get that in any other any other career a friend who's who's a paramedic for for many years very similar sort of thing he'd say that yeah, sometimes it was it was often a good job, and it's you know it's not one of the jobs. 
tell you, it's a different thing, but I used to support adults with learning disabilities, and mm-hmm. I used to get this thing that people found out what I did. They said, oh, you must have a heart of gold. And I used to think, no, I've got, I've got rent to pay. Yeah. <laughs> you know? well, it doesn't mean that I'm not caring, but I, it's not, I'm not doing it because I'm Gandhi or something. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I think that's I'm kind I'm a of, professional, damn it. Well, well, I think that's what a lot of, you know, I think that's with nurses. Like, I mean, I look at my wife, she's a nurse as well, um, and she really is like probably like was it your sister-in-law do you mean her her it's her vocation oh yeah like i mean yeah she, like i just think i want you looking after me i don't want me well <laughs> you know like, like i i mean i i think i am a pretty good nurse but like at the same time there's people who are just like they just ooze just born to do just it. born to do it and and i was never that i don't think i was ever that like i was i was good at my job and i actually like gave a shit about mm. people um but it was never like do you know what I mean I was like well I get paid pretty well like and especially I was living with my grandparents rent free do you know what I mean I was like I'm getting like yeah, I've, a, pr- felt- a pretty decent wage I kind of I work three days a week because it's like 12 hour days so therefore I've got four days a week where I can just do nothing and mm. dick around and you know at that time it was all like near enough kind of not well maybe tail end of the music scene kind of i guess a little bit kind of late 2000s rather yeah, than for, early for anyone not local there's we <laughs> i try not to dwell on it but there was a, a golden age yeah. of bands in ipswich there was like over 80 bands and whatever but it was yeah so it should be, you mean i could have all that time to do all of that and then all of the band you know you'd have evenings off to do band practices and to bowling and all you know it was brilliant and it so it really did actually give like a good if you wanted a like a, a good local life it was mm. amazing my i've just never wanted that i've always wanted to be in another country i've always wanted to go traveling i've always wanted to just be a bit of a like nomad i guess i think people who have who have traveled can't can't drop that i can't drop that and i've not traveled a great deal but I, I haven't been abroad, well, despite lockdown. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I haven't been abroad for pleasure. I've done it for work, which I also enjoy. Yeah. But I haven't been abroad for pleasure for probably two or three years. And I start to feel claustrophobic. I don't, I don't know if well, that's I'm, the only way to describe it. I feel the same. Like, you know, the wife and I have just been doing loads of work on the house recently and whatever else. But, like, we've, because of I'm self employed, like, I'm working like all hours, mm. like, literally just seven days a week. I work and then like I'm always I'm always being self employed like I can't afford it I can't afford to have a week off and pay for holiday blah blah and then I'm kind of like god I really need to go somewhere I'm actually going to Cyprus in like 10 days oh. to go and learn to free dive okay so you're going to Cyprus to learn free diving so you're going to go and learn how to do something exceptional I guess kind of unusual with your body I hope so, yeah. We'll you hope see, so? Yeah, we'll see how it goes, I guess. <laughs> or I'll drown. Yeah, one of exactly, the two. one of the two. So uh, th- this does lead on to kind of when you were, you'd been nursing for a while. Yeah. And you, you, well, I won't tell you a story. What, what happened when you'd been nursing for a while? I just, so I, I guess, my time in India and New Zealand, in, in You keep Canada, giving it away. I keep giving it away. My time in Canada when I was snowboarding, there was like a, a yoga studio there and basically i ended up getting totally hooked on yoga and would spend hours like literally like four hours a day doing yoga and then like three hours a day up the mountain or something like that mm. um and so then i like after a while i was like, i think i want to be a yoga teacher i'm gonna be a yoga teacher that's a good idea um i'm just trying to count the careers on my hand oh now. like just uh, you need about seven hands i think like <laughs> i just i get bored easily um and so i came back from in Canada was working, 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 and then I was a bit like, "No, I'm going to do it." And so I signed up for a course in India. And Don't do things by halves either, do you? Kind of no, snowboarding well, in Canada. Let's do it, Canada. Yeah, yoga, India. Well, you know, I figure if you're going to do yoga, you might as well go to the the home country of yoga. Yes, so. it's the source, really. Exactly. Isn't it? So I went out to Goa and spent two months training in Goa at a, what's now one of the biggest schools in Goa, I think. Um, and then how was that just just you you kind of you paste over these things or you skip over them as if it's just something anyone would <laughs> anyone would do I think do. it's just the sort of thing uh, yeah I guess so it's what, a, what was your first day Carl, let, let, let's, let's kind of dig day, into it your first day walking into was it like an academy or a school so it's basically just a, like a bunch of huts on a beach essentially um <laughs> And they like because I'm the, laughing with joy. Because That's, of, I'm not because mocking of, because by the way. of the monsoon seasons, they have to take it all down. Like at the end, so come June, 
Well, like in Father End Ted, where they take the roads up when it's raining. Yeah, basically, they literally, like, everything gets taken apart. Like, the whole of the um, the studio, the, like, the Charlas, the like, the big slab so floors. So, Charlas, like, where you practice, that's big, like, open space, okay. really. Um, and then there's, like, there was about 25 or 30, like, beach hut type things where it had, like, beds and en suites and stuff. And they all get taken down every year. Wow. Um, and then... So, yeah, basically my first day, like, because I got there a few days before the course started. So it was like literally just like walking along this beach and then kind of going and having a pint in the pub, in the bar next door. And then just seeing all these clearly kind of mostly sort of white women sort of wearing yoga leggings and sort of not a lot really just sitting there all having a laugh. So I kind of started chatting to them and it worked out that they were the, the... crew who were just finishing their course and then right. ours would be finished ours would be starting like two days later so yeah then i just started hanging out with them really and then it was just it's kind of weird because it's just yeah you kind of you're just this white english person in a and and it's set up for it i mean go is just set up for essentially tourism of like us east so, us western europeans like going over and doing yoga trainings so during during the course was there was it a particularly tough regime or uh, it, it was go? like well it just depends it didn't have to be as tough as maybe i made it because i would get up at like five and go and meditate with my my teacher so we'd be up at five from like half five till half six we would sit on the rocks at the end of the beach and meditate and then from like seven till eight thirty you would do your full physical practice then 8 30 till 9 30 i think it was you would then do um like breathing practices and like there's these things called like um kriyas which is all about like cleansing the body so it's kind of if you ever did the old trick of like sticking the uh the like, straw- strawberry lace down your nose. I was going to say, it it's a shame. Mouth. Shame this is audio because the actions here yeah, are brilliant. Sticking up your nose, out your mouth, and like floss. So <laughs> no, was, I've never done that. No, so I know some people have. Um, so it was kind of like using like a like a thread essentially, and you'd stick it up through your nostril, and you'd have to take it out <laughs> through your mouth, and then you'd floss your nose, and then using like a what they called like a a, a netty pot, and you basically put like lukewarm water. And you pour it in one nostril and it goes out the other side. And it's all about like clearing your sinuses. Okay. It's like salt, slightly salty water. So the idea is that it kind of takes a lot of the congestion out of your sinuses and stuff like that. So it was all things like that. And then it'd be breakfast and then it would be like theory practice. So like learning about the postures, learning about anatomy, the, you know yoga anatomy is not it's it's not the hottest place to go and learn about anatomy was, in it, was it strange having done nursing for so it long? was because i definitely like the anatomy side was i was kind of a thought it was just a little bit of a joke in all fairness so you could say you have a you, as a nurse you have a very practical understanding and you've seen well putting it re- reducing it to mechanics you've seen a lot of bodies yeah in a lot of different states, yeah. Some more, some broken, some you know healed. Yeah. All lots of various things. So then, being told things that the things that just weren't true. Or well, it's that... more just like the the sheer like uh, childishness is maybe the wrong word, but like you know like infant level anatomy essentially. So you know, bearing in mind, this is I kind hand. of feel yeah, not far <laughs> off like bicep, tricep, <laughs> really like quadricep like not even necessarily a breakdown of what all the different quadricep muscles are and then like you know this muscle is like the you know is being stretched in this pose this one and do you know what I mean as someone who is a bit of an anatomy geek it's kind of like yeah oh, so it, really... wasn't, it wasn't it wasn't wrong it was just, it wasn't it was wrong just it wasn't right it was just really 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 simplistic mm. and you know I kind of feel there's a lot of people who and I was kind of thinking about this the other day and thinking about trying to write a post about it. But there's a lot of people who are told, go and do yoga because you've got a bad back, you've got a bad hip, knee, whatever. The, the doctors are prescribing yoga near enough these mm. days. And my problem is most of the time, yoga teachers haven't got a bloody clue. Like, you know, that you know, you know, oh, you've got a bad back. Here's a prescription. Here's a, a set of poses which is good for your back. Mm. Not... That was air quotes for that good for you. Yeah, that was... I, I air There's no quote point doing it so again. They still can't see. I, I, yeah, I air quote a lot. Uh, <laughs> so, um, 
you know what I mean? There's no, there's nothing specific for that person. You know, if you've got a bad back, and yes, I guess if you go and do yoga, just a general gentle hatha yoga class, which is just like you know the gentlest form, I guess you probably are going to get benefits and less back pain because you're just moving in a say, new way which your body just, hasn't moved. Just moving is a, is is a, a good start, thing, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, but a little bit kind of like what we were saying, I guess, prior to coming on, you know, sometimes you need to be assessed and like figure out that actually your back pain is coming from, you know, your foot or something. Mm. And you, I mean, you can do all the yoga class in the world you want if you've got neck pain or back pain, but the problem's the fact that your little toes wonky or your heels wonky like all the yoga in the world stretching your back out is only ever gonna at best give you a, a short term well, I guess, guess it's like a lot of things no, nothing is is gonna work in isolation exactly you, yeah. can't, you can't no matter what malady you have you can't do one thing that fixes it and i think that's something that i'm not judging the whole of humanity but that is something that kind of troubles me about the way some things are portrayed especially sold, especially yeah. in the health and well well-being and to be honest it's starting to happen in the sort of the the sort of the mindfulness yeah oh, 100%. sort of space which which is a space I'm I'm very much invested in and, and, and very much like yeah. but it troubles me that even things like meditation our meditation will solve everything like yeah. if you've got like broken leg yeah so I'm, that's extreme so that's a ridiculous awful kind of argument but do you know what i mean it's it's not any one thing isn't going to fix you 100 percent, and that's kind of you know my thing if you like at the moment i kind of really struggle with i mean i guess this goes on to where i've my journey's come into these days but like i really struggle with you know seeing on instagram and whatever else of like oh you know if you've got back pain come sign up for this six weeks course and you'll get like these postures which will help your back which again they might if mm. you if you just never move awesome they probably will give you some reprieve because actually some movement is good is better than well you, you can't is better than none it's it's the the way the adverts for me it's the, it's the way that you know they are portrayed as a panacea yeah, so somebody exactly. who's been sat on a settee watching tv for 25 years and seeing an advert that says this will fix your back pain yeah go and do these poses as you say yeah they're not sat on the settee as much exactly. and they aren't all moving so it is gonna so help you get more blood flow all of that stuff and it fit in the, and the joint and the joints muscles whatever go oh that's nice to just just to move something but i'm i'm not a health professional which won't come as a shock to anyone <laughs> <laughs> but that that does sound like treating the symptom not the cause it, yeah absolutely which I guess, do you know what I mean? That's so, you know, if we go from my nursing, I left nursing for yoga because, so I went from coronary care into um, accident emergency. Yeah. And in both of those worlds, there's like lifestyle type changes where I feel like it's completely overlooked. Like simple lifestyle changes could be implemented to reduce a whole bunch of what these people are coming in with. So the, the word simple is interesting in that sentence because not so much now, but I'm a kid of the 70s. Mm -hmm. And if you jogged, to be honest, if you did any exercise at all, you were seen as a freak. Yeah. It was utterly bizarre. It was also the worst time for food. Yeah. <laughs> just, yeah. We had pink, pink chocolate. I still don't know what that was. <laughs> but, but these kind of people are becoming more aware but you're talking about simple changes so can you can you give an example so even i mean i was just looking at some research papers uh recently which is basically what i do a lot of now so with my yoga and stuff it's kind of led me into a lot of breathing hence free diving that's mm -hmm. what i want to go to oh, no, like, to me that makes total where sense that, where but... that's going you know a lot of i spend a lot of time doing breathing practices and that's led me to want to if you like push my push my game a little bit um but simple like breathing exercises like we as humanity as a western culture we all over breathe near over enough over breathe over breathe yes you can over breathe i really thought that you were going to say the total opposite of that no no we all like we all over breathe like most people as a nurse you take someone's respiratory rate and it's pretty much guaranteed to be somewhere between like is that just Breaths in, breaths, breaths out. in, breaths in. So in one minute, how many times you breathe in and out? Mm -hmm. And you can almost guarantee someone will be somewhere 18 to 22 breaths a minute. That's nearly the standard. Now, most of the research shows that if you get someone breathing at six breaths a minute, 
Which, Six? Well, it's not that hard. Like, if you breathe in for four seconds... Breathe out for six. Well, the first thing I do is—I'm is, is <laughs> generally quite a relaxed person yeah, anyway. Yeah. But no, it's, it, it, I can see. I so, can see. It's, so, there's an instant effect there. It, yeah, it really is. Like, and but the thing is, the way—and again, this comes down to a whole bunch of like crazy science, which I won't. It's not crazy. But it's just a little bit confusing when you can't when you first get your head around it. But we kind of see carbon dioxide as being a negative thing when we breathe. Like, i.e., you oh. breathe in oxygen and then you create carbon dioxide which is a waste gas and you blow it out it's certainly what you learn at school oxygen good carbon dioxide bad yeah. wrong go on tell us basically so the way i mean this is like without graphs this is going to be slightly difficult i guess but there's this thing called the bohr effect which was like invented discovered whatever you want to call it by a I want to say Norwegian. Somewhat, somewhere, I think he was Scandinavian. Somewhere like, north of Alborough. Yeah, definitely north of Alborough, 100%. <laughs> um, in like 1902. And basically, as the level of... I, I can't, I'm going to butcher it because I can't remember quite how to pronounce it. Say if you've got a graph, I'll put, I'll put it on the show notes. I'll see if I, I'll send it over. But okay. as the level of carbon dioxide goes up in your body, oxygen is then pushed off your hemoglobin so hemoglobin carries the oxygen into your cells mm -hmm. if you have a low level of co2 oxygen sticks like glue to your hemoglobin so therefore your muscles or your brain or whatever needs that oxygen won't take that oxygen it will just stick to it and the oxygen will just go round and round in a circle okay so if you increase the level of carbon dioxide you're breathing or you that you're not breathing out let's say so by breathing slowly so instead of going you just breathe. That never sounds good on the telephone. Anyway. No, it doesn't either, does it? <laughs> or probably won't over a microphone either. Um, but then, basically, the, essentially, that carbon dioxide pushes the oxygen out of the hemoglobin and in, into the tissues. So if you imagine like a bus stop, mm -hmm. like you've got a bus full of people, which is your, like, your bus is your tissue, is your muscle, let's say, and it's full of carbon dioxide. As the oxygen comes around, all the carbon dioxide wants to get off to get out your body, so therefore it pushes out the back door, and then the, hem the oxygen has no way to go but in through the front door, and mm -hmm. it fills up, and therefore your tissues get fresh blood, no, sorry, fresh oxygen, aerobic respiration rather than anaerobic respiration, okay. feeds it properly. So therefore, what we're trying to do is to, what I'm trying to do with my clients my students whatever else is to teach them to breathe slower to increase levels of carbon dioxide a little bit again it comes down to jazzy sciencey stuff but things called chemo uh chemo re, uh chemo receptors which are like in the arteries in your neck okay and then in the brain stem and this is like prehistoric stuff um which if you're if you constantly over breathe these things then reset to have to a lower level of carbon dioxide so therefore things like anxiety panic attacks um even some depressions even adhd there's some research and papers showing that over breathing and mouth breathing is linked to these conditions because you reset your chemoreceptors to um to be used to a low level of carbon dioxide. Possibly so making therefore, a cognitive leap here, but kind of think about people hyperventilating with anxiety. Mm -hmm. You stick a brown bag in front of them. No, I remember that. I mean, I'm, I'm quite open about the fact I suffer from anxiety, but even as a child, yeah, I was given the brown paper bag. And why did you do that? Well, at the time, it was a reflexology thing, and it was to like, it was to encourage the amount of carbon, box, carbon dioxide. It still is doing. It's exactly the same and that's thing. That's going back a long time. It's that exactly is. the same thing. You stick a car, you stick a brown bag, and, and you rebreathe that carbon dioxide. Make which, sure there's no receipts in the bottom. Yeah, you, you don't want moist receipts. Um, <laughs> but yeah, essentially, you then um, you breathe that cut level of carbon dioxide back in, which then allows the blood to the oxygen to get into your tissues, into your brain, um, and then you kind of essentially re over practice with time and stuff you can reset your chemoreceptors to deal with these conditions better so anxiety and you know if you just hold your breath for a prolonged period of time you begin to feel like holy shit i'm gonna drown i'm gonna suffocate i need to breathe you've still got if you put an oxygen probe on your finger you've still got like 97 percent oxygen in your blood wow so you, you're not short on oxygen your co2 levels are just beginning to creep up and you're just your brain and your 
your reflexes aren't used to dealing with it. So it tells you to panic, to breathe. Mm -hmm. So what I do with my clients who come for me for breathing and stuff is we just work on that and you and through lots of different protocols lots of different practices we retrain you to deal with these things better and then you know we get people to tape them I, I tape my mouth shut at night so you tape your mouth shut at night yeah get some like 3m sorry advertising but uh right, micro pore they, they tape can pay me if they want yeah, yeah um it's um yeah basically just micro pore tape the sort of stuff you get from the hospital from pharmacies yeah stick it over your mouth and it just holds your lips together and most of it's like mouth breathing at night is really really common so people like end up yes the snoring yeah basically and like so and it's really again like loads of research for sleep apnea um even leading into like obstructive sleep apnea and stuff like that can all come around further down the line through like poor like dysfunctional breathing patterns and so by taping the mouth shut you're forced to breathe through your nose you breathe like you've got like 20 percent is it 20 percent like less oh god again i'm gonna mess up numbers again i'm terrible with numbers but essentially obviously it's a smaller a smaller hole yeah. so the restriction of air coming in is smaller so it's really easy to like snore with your mouth you just have to like you know mm. you breathe hard and fast and there's a lot of flappy things back in exactly. the back of your mouth as well isn't there yeah exactly and when you breathe your nose you tone Again, I could I don't have a picture obviously, but when you look at the nasal cavity, I mean it's the size of a large billiard ball. Like there's a hole in your face which is like the size of a large billiard ball behind your nose. Mm. And that's the air comes into that and it gets warmed, it gets like filtered, it gets cleaned and then and it as you breathe through your nose, it tones up all that flappy like the glottis and the Really? So and you you literally toning the muscles. You're toning all of that tissue down the back of your throat and in the back of your mouth by breathing through your nose and when you breathe through your mouth you're not and it's all just it gets all flappy and then you start snoring and you start breathing harder and faster because when you're asleep you're obviously feeling you've got that oxygen starvation feeling like subconsciously while mm -hmm. you're sleeping so therefore your body tries to breathe harder and faster and it just gets into a vicious cycle um, and this goes I mean you can go down a million rabbit holes of all this stuff and there's a guy with who I like kind of mates with online he's a type 1 diabetic and he's looking at all of the research in as far as breathing and diabetes is concerned and it's it's kind of mind-blowing what just breathing properly can do so for that is a fantastic example of you're saying people coming into a and e when you're an a and e nurse and just saying simple changes could have prevented this from happening uh, yeah absolutely i mean if you like as far as like probably the best guy currently on online talking about all this is a guy called Rongan Chatterjee he was like the doctor in the house on the BBC he's a GP okay uh, but he basically talks about like functional medicine I guess it's all this kind of how we can do this rather than prescribing things yeah um, but he kind of puts in all you know he uses all of this with his clients and when I was in A&E I used to do people come in with like you've got to take some blood from them and they'd be like nope needle phobic real panicky and I'd just be like right I've done my yoga training, whatever else at this point. So I was like, let's just do some slow breathing. I just sit there with them for five minutes, lie them down, just 10, 12 second breaths. And you just like their sympathetic drive, their fight and flight would just drop through the floor. Their parasympathetic tone would just all get activated and then they'd feel relaxed. That, that's... Is the rest and digest. Yeah. So rest, digest, reproduce and fight and flight and freeze is the sympathetic. So, um, you know we all live mostly in a fight and flight and freeze state because of just modern culture well, I read, read constantly. somewhere that that we're still the the advancement of mankind has been so fast over the last two three hundred years that but we've still got caveman brains yeah, exactly so I we're mean, constantly looking out for tigers around corners and things and that that's all us. constantly and again this comes down to what our chemoreceptors and stuff like that are all about they're all about like they they judge the level of stress within your body within the environment and if you are constantly stressed and you're constantly like <laughs> like essentially they're always going to be on a this heightened state of like awareness and then you know we never look at a cat or a dog or like you know you watch a cheetah or you know on youtube and they balls to the wall i'm going to catch that whatever it is like kill it 
then they sleep for like. I was gonna say that that's the the rest of the time they do nothing. They do nothing. We went to, I was at Colchester Zoo with my daughter a little while ago, and we were looking at the the big birds of prey. Yeah. And the the zookeeper said people often complain that they come and see the birds of prey and they're not doing anything. Yeah. They're like, no, of course they're not because it takes an incredible amount of energy. Exactly. And and why would you? I mean, as a human race, we are the worst breathers. We're the worst eaters. Um, we're like the worst relaxers. Like I mean, we're 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 pretty much top of the table for just the worst at just about everything as far as a functional, like healthy life is concerned. Um, it's the fallacy of intelligence, though, isn't it? Right, exactly. Animals act on instinct. We think watching Coronation Street or binging yeah, Netflix the, is good but, for and, us. But the crazy thing is, like all of that stuff as well, it constantly is feeding into your sympathetic drive. So even you know, you go and watch Game of Thrones, like there's constant bangs and like words and then someone getting their head chopped off and big fight scenes and then like tension and you know there's huge tense scenes which are building for like 15 minutes and you can just feel your heart doing <laughs> I, this I, I was watching um i don't have any more but i used to have an apple watch and part of the reason i got rid of it is because i, I just got crazed by being told things sort of go for a walk stand oh, up just stand up or like i'm having a poo i'm not gonna <laughs> yeah. stand up but but i know so i was watching breaking bad it started it started giving me health alerts and it would say your your your, your heart rate abnormally high and then it would say we don't call the i can't remember what the words are it's just something like we're not going to call 999 for you yeah yeah and i was like thinking i'm pretty sure i'm okay but clearly not but that's i mean but again that's that monkey brain that prehistoric lizard brain is just like and you can try to overthink i was listening to a book by robert sapowski who's like a primatologist he's like I have, to, like, I have to make notes on these things because actually just just pay attention and rewind if you're listening to yeah, the podcast. Yeah, I mean, he's, he wrote a book called Why Don't Zebras Get Ulcers? Um, <laughs> and again, it's all about stress and anxiety and all that kind of stuff. And But there's also another one, which I think brain or mind or something. I can't, I, I've got it as an audio book. I can't remember what it's called. But um, he talks in there about... Um, almost like how on a prius on a like the basal on the really like prehistoric brain we're almost all like if you like racist because like we have this response to people of different colors or whatever else and and this part of our brain jumps out and says ah there's they're not the same as us but then our modern like the more recent part of our brain says like you know seconds later shut up yeah, <laughs> don't be stupid but like the save us thing in like the prehistoric brain is like you're different from me like you're not part of my tribe like ah this this uh, not that particular aspect but what we're talking about does tie into something else which which i've kind of learned about recently i had a client who's um she's a hypnotherapist and hello helen if you're listening to this and she was explaining to me with hypnotherapy it's because the caveman brain does its best, but has no real opinions about things. No, it's almost it's quite black your, and white. Your like. consciousness is the one that, that does the thinking. But the problem is that if you're stressed, your subconscious, the caveman part of your brain, doesn't know the difference between that and there being an actual Absolutely. tiger in front of you. Absolutely. And it, it acts accordingly and it prepares your body accordingly. And Or by, by preparing it basically just holds you in that state. This is an interesting thing. Now, I'm, behave, by the way, it was called Behave. That other book by Robert Sapowski. Okay, cool. I might pester you for some links afterwards. Yeah. But um, read. I was trying to figure out something recently, and and I'm not now. I've got friends who are doctors, and and what all all their friends do is say, look, I I know you're a doctor, but, and they then try and get medical info. I'm not yeah. doing that. But I, I I was reading something the other day about saying, what's the difference between? Hang on, let me get my thoughts in order. They're saying you you train your, your cardio mm -hmm. system to strengthen it, and you do that by putting it under stress. Yep. So how come hypertension doesn't make you super fit? And I, I, I guess it's just because it, you, you need a recovery time, do you? you do, I mean, same, I, I guess, let me just have a little thing. But really, if you think of, you know, when you, the way, if you're like another jazz, you think barrier reflex is concerned, but that's how the, like, essentially, like the blood pressure and heart rate work together so as like one goes up the other should come down one goes up the other should come oh, right. down okay um so therefore when you do like slow breathing what you'll probably feel is like that your heart pumps harder but the heart rate goes down 
Mm. So therefore, all of a sudden, if you drop your heart rate to like 30 beats a minute, so if you think of mega good athletes, like, you know, triathletes, whatever else, they've probably got like 30 to 40 beats a minute, you know, heart rates, but their blood pressure will probably be slightly more on the stronger side. It won't be abnormal, but it will probably be slightly more on the stronger side because mm. if you're going to have a heart rate which is only going to, you know, bud's only going to go around 30 times a minute compared to 60 times a minute, you're going to have to pump it slightly so harder. shove to, it harder, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <clears throat> so you kind of have that. There's this playoff going through that. And again, it probably comes down to, you know, you put me on the spot here, but I would assume <laughs> like, you know, the, again, one of the problems of exercise is whether you're doing it aerobically or anaerobically. So whether it's with oxygen or without oxygen, which is where, again, I would say if you nose breathe, it's much harder when you do it, but you're constantly, you're never over exercising. Okay. You only ever go as hard as you can still breathe through your nose. Well, speaking to a, a strength conditioning coach um, through a project I'm doing with my brother-in-law, and he said one of the biggest problems he has, especially with endurance athletes, is them over-exercising. Yeah. He spends a lot of his time telling them just to stop exercising. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, I, I do think this comes down to the cheetah, the leopard, whatever. Just, you know, your body can't, it's not, I mean, those guys who do that endurance stuff, I've got some mates who did like the Canada 520k triathlon you know, ultra marathon thing. It's just freakish. They're it's freaks. Just, I mean, it's incredible. And I say that like, with a lot of respect. Yeah, yeah. They like, I, it's mind blowing how they do it. But again, like, I kind of look at it and think, I'm, I'm a bit more. Well, I'm basically just pretty lazy. I think. Like, I just like to efficient. I, th- yeah, I call it efficient. efficient. Yeah, exactly. I like to do something and then, like, stop and, <laughs> and try and do not a lot. Um, and I do think, you know, if you're constantly exercising, you're pushing your cardiovascular system to be stronger and healthier but there's no downside there's no switch off of sympathetic drive it's all just like just go go just go, 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 go 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 like your brain isn't necessarily gonna associate i don't know like that improved like exercise tolerance with like health as such and like, that's where kind of this whole war- stuff gets pretty muddy as to what's what's healthy and what's like, do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know, my wife's doing a nutrition course at the moment and it's pretty mind blowing as to the ideas of what's actually unhealthy and mm. what's not. Um, and it's a bit like exercise as well, I think. if you, I, I think you've got to always have like this place in which there's a, a stopping point and you can let it go and relax and let the s- nervous system Re- recalibrate I guess it makes sense to me because I might be making a bit of a cognitive leap but we're talking about watching Game of Thrones and your caveman brain thinking you're under attack you know my, my, <coughs> my brother-in-law his he ran did 36 miles in four hours last <sighs> last Saturday my, my maths is pretty terrible got failed it, it four times at school so but it's, um, it's a lot yeah I can't my math my miles per hour is like that's Hang on. It was about seven and a half miles an hour. Y- yeah, but he was gutted because he wanted to do forty-eight, <sighs> and it's just. But his his, uh, you know, the, his support team around him just said stop. Yeah, because I can tell. Do you know what? it was his breathing? Yeah, it was. It's, it's quite amazing. I'll, I'll, I need to put you in touch with him. At least get him to listen to yeah, this. Yeah. because it was his breathing. He can do it. He's done twenty-four hour runs, um, uh, and. His body, he can just push it way past where I would yeah, expect yeah. any human should be able to. But the one of the guys we're with, who's, who's kind of one of his coaches, I've got a bit on, on tape. Uh, I was there filming it um, for making a little documentary. And I said, how's he doing? And he said, he said he's not breathing. Yeah. He said he's, he's, he's completely <clears throat> lost the ability to breathe and get himself through this. He's become obsessed with his chest being tight and his nasal cavity closing up yeah and he said that may or may not be happening but because he has decided that he's not going to complete but what we're doing it today probably is doing that as well because like essentially I think he ended up having a cold actually yeah. <laughs> so. but the thing about the weird thing about the nose is like unless you breathe through it like all the time it's going to get narrower and it's, it's a very much a use it or lose it again some study they did with people who had had um what they called Tracheotomy? Uh, yeah, tracheotomy type things. Hole in the neck. Hole in the, hole in the throat, basically, to breathe through. And I think they found within uh, two weeks to eight, two to eight weeks, on all of these people, like there was a big study done on like 
400 people or whatever else in this place in America. And they found that basically all of them, their nose had like completely closed up. Just completely, completely sealed up. Completely closed up. Like they couldn't breathe through it at all. And it's basically a use it or lose it. The body's like crazy efficient slash lazy. I don't know how you want to look <laughs> at it. But like if you're not using something, it just won't bother having it anymore, which is like movement again. Well, so, muscle, muscles atrophy fast. Don't way they? quicker than you ever get it back. Do you mm. know what I mean? Um, and so... Yeah, do you know what I mean? it might well be, especially if you're running the whole time and you're blowing out, blowing out, blowing out, then <clears throat> and you're not really <sighs> breathing through your nose. Again, it's probably then your your brain will just be kind of like almost like closing down. Those sinuses will just begin to close down. You'll only have your mouth, and then again you're into a, the aero- the anaerobic stage, and then lots of lactic acid and all that other stuff, and pH numbers being. All well, that, that was what he he said had happened. He he pointed at his his muscles. At the tops of his thighs he said i can feel they're not getting oxygen now mm-hmm. so i think he's sort of very sympathetic to his body yeah but no he's, i find the whole thing kind of freakish and fascinating <laughs> but that's uh, going back to the i guess the point where we started like something as simple as learning to breathe can change so you're saying lives. that could that when you were working in a and e you saw people who if they were breathing correctly probably wouldn't have needed to bend i know i'm not i'm not expecting it's, you to uh, it's to, kind of there i would suggest there's definitely people who if they were to be able to tolerate the stresses in their life better through a better breathing technique they might they might might not end up needing some of the services and cares and whatever else Again, they do it's not one thing and it's isolation, not one thing it? but it's such an easy obvious massive thing that like do you know what I mean we all breathe mm. like a lot every that, day. I was listening to a really interesting podcast, and somebody was talking about meditation. It wasn't a it wasn't a well it wasn't sort of a wellness podcast. It was an American comedian, and she she was asked, "What's the one thing you wish everyone knew?" And she said, "I wish everyone knew how to meditate because it doesn't require Anything. training as such, but <clears throat> breathing is even easier." And, than but the that. thing, and, and my problem with like med because I, I meditate mm-hmm. not as much as I have done previously, but my problem with meditating is everyone goes, my brain's too busy. I can't do it. My brain's too busy. Like, I've got too much going on. No, not not meditating. No, can't do it. Well, not if you've decided you're not. But that's that's where their headspace goes. Whereas what I'm doing now with people is rather than sort of trying to get them to meditate, is I'm doing breathing with them. And actually what you do is, again, it's a mindful practice essentially. Because, you know, mindfulness is just focusing on the breath to a certain degree. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like a mindful meditation practice in its most basic form is probably like, just feel your breath as you breathe in and feel the breath as you oh, breathe out. And big, it, big fan of that. And it, and it just keeps you focused. Now, in yoga, you kind of have these eight limbs and, you know, you kind of have this, as it steps up, you have the physical side, the asana, and then the next step is the breathing. And then after that, it leads into meditations and all that. But the, med- the breathing leads into the meditation. And if you can breathe, so I now do like between... 20 minutes in an hour and 10 minutes of breathing most mornings um and the headspace is amazing it's amazing because you just you sit there and sometimes it's fast breathing <laughs> sometimes it's just like super slow like i try and put my fingers or something under my nose and try not to breathe try not to feel the breath wow. on my hand sometimes it's just like in for 10 or in i'm about in for 11 hold for 44 out for 22 and then do that 10 to 12 times. Um, I'm fascinated to know when, when you've done your free diving training. Let me know. I, I will ask you. I'll, I'll endeavour to ask you because I want to see if that changes. Yeah, well, it should I mean, do, I guess. I'm, yeah, I mean, all, I'm, you know, all of this is kind of building me up to my free diving, I guess. But, um, but yeah, like, I forgot where we were going with it. But, like, um, yeah, though, yeah, that headspace I get from doing that then allows me to sit in meditation way easier way longer it just gets you there faster then. yeah basically okay so this is this has all been fascinating I've, I've learned a lot as i think i do every time i speak to you which is probably not often enough actually with <laughs> yeah i know okay so let, let's kind of let's draw to a, a kind of a conclusion so you've been through nursing snowboarding yoga and we've sort of touched and well you've, you've explained part of what you're doing now but you've not really sort of given us the sum of it So I've kind of moved from, as you say, all of that other stuff, which has all led me to where I am now, which is doing kind of one-to-one movement therapy, if you like. There's some air quotes there because I don't really know what else to call it. Um, 
and this includes a lot of breathing work, which obviously we've just fairly done in, in depth. Um, but through the work, through some work I've learned through a chap called Gary Ward, um, we he's pretty much mapped out how the body should move through every step of the gait cycle and, and how so you explain the word gait. So gait how you walk essentially. Okay. Um, how your feet interact with the ground and how every single bone, if you like, up to your skull interacts with that foot touching the ground, whether it be the heel, the forefoot, the toe, as you roll through that whole foot strike. Um, and so now my work is basically assessing a body, and this is where I've kind of left yoga behind, I guess, and like I said, it's all a bit, um, as you say, that looking for that panacea of like, oh, this pose will fix your back. Yeah. And it's actually like, that's not really the case. So now, you know, everyone who, I, who comes see me gets like a full, we do like 90 minutes sessions and they are like a full assessment of like everything from how the bone, there's a bone in your foot called your talus, how that is sitting through to how high one side of your pelvis is compared to the other, which way your spine flexes, which way your head flexes, you know, whether or not sometimes one eye is a bit more closed than the other. And we look at, I try to look at everything. Mm. And and then we kind of, again, a bit like what we touched on with uh, having a little wedge in your foot for your back pain when you're being specific. Is, yeah, but before we started recording, I, I, I fell out of a very fast moving car when I was 16. And um, I always say I should have died. I, I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I had a terrible back problems for years and years and years. And I went to a chiropractor who did massively help. But I went to go and see a sports physio who I'll name. is a guy called Will Dykes. Um, you know, I'll happily refer people to him. And he, he took one look at me. And the first thing he said was, you've been in a car accident. And I was like, uh, yes. And I thought, oh, how could he tell that? But it's just because he saw the way my hips were, the, mm. the way it was. And he gave me a little wedge. And it pretty much fixed me Oh, well not that just that it was also strength yeah, exercises course, yeah, yeah. and I do a, but having do, that adjustment to the foot but so small it was such yeah. a tiny and I'm a I am not a small person but it is kind of crazy how you see again you know I've kind of had clients who have been walking on the insides of their feet for like most of their life and then I've put a wedge we, we use these wedges, so you don't put them in the shoes, we do the exercise with them essentially. But these wedges, I put them under the inside of the instep of their foot, like under the, the heel and the big toe. And I got this person to do this exercise and, and they nearly passed out. Like, what? because th their nervous system just like was not used to being in that position. And we put this movement where all of a sudden, all of her joints did this thing, which she hasn't been able to do since she was basically born. And like she, her whole nervous system just went just went into shutdown. <laughs> wow. Um, and it's like just by moving... You need to give us a happy ending to that. Where you, can't, well, you can't lose Oh, no, she, she had a nap and then she literally went and had a little lay down, had a nap and then God, was love a good nap. right as rain after. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but, I mean, it, do you know what I mean? It's kind of like you put a bone in the foot in the right place and you can... It's amazing how much it works wonders. Because, again, we said it before we got started, but... You know, if you can go and have a massage or whatever else on your neck, so you've got neck pain, but then you've got a right wonky foot for whatever reason, you've fallen out of a car and you, your hips end up getting squiffed, so your leg's a bit shorter, um, and so your heel doesn't really touch the floor, you put a wedge under it, and your brain suddenly, your nervous system suddenly goes, huh, that heel's on the floor. And then all of a sudden, like, it lights up this entire muscular system of like being moved by these joints but actually being moved properly. And and you suddenly go, oh, my neck's, the pain's gone. Mm. So I do, we do some exercises around it, do some breathing around it, and then they go for a walk, we, we repeat, and we basically, it's, it's a bit like, I kind of joke, I kind of did a podcast a while back, um, and said it's a bit like in Shrek when they're talking about, you know, ogres like onions, they've got loads of different layers or something. And, donkey said something about parfait um but essentially the body is just full of layers layers and layers and layers of injuries of insults and so you know i it, the, the biggest thing for me is getting people to realize that it's not a one session fixes all mm. but essentially you get people to once they get the buy-in once they suddenly go wow like that's completely changed my head my neck pain my, my migraines have gone just by doing that then they kind of hopefully begin to realize that 
even if that's gone, you're still not at a place where it either won't come back or you won't get another pain somewhere else. And so it's kind of peeling back the layers to try to okay. undo as many insults that the body has received as possible. We, yeah, I do know just from my own experience, the body will, will compensate for and things in, in really... Incredible know, sh- manners. Short, short, in kind of short-term gains or short-term fixes that become long-term problems. It, and it's exactly what it is. So essentially, and it's the same with breathing, a short-term fix of breathing quickly is actually a long-term like issue Mm. and so it's the same with the body and so these two kind of factors i guess have come together of like all the work i've done through studying with a guy called patrick McEwen, which is the breathing and then a guy called gary ward which is the moving and trying to bring the two things together to hopefully let people move better and breathe better and so many of the issues i i always saw as a nurse by moving and breathing better could have resolved potentially some of those people ever being it's in the, hospital. The true cliche of prevention better than cure. Exactly. And that's, you know, whatever you want to say about what, uh, Eastern medicine and whatever else, but essentially the, the purpose of Eastern medicine was purely prevention. Like mm. it was never, do you know I mean, like acupuncture and like yoga and all of that stuff. It's, it's, it's all there as like a, a prevention of like illness essentially and that's what i think that's that's basically where i've been led from from nursing i was just always i always felt like like you're just dealing with people too late the horse has already bolted and so i wanted to go back and try and catch them before they ever needed to go to go to the hospital like mm. yeah people with six months a year two year history of fairly long-standing non-specific low back pain and you know they've done the physio routes they've done this they've done that and like i want it to be somebody else who can kind of go let's have another look at you from a different perspective and yeah so that's kind of what i'm doing now and actually having you know pretty reasonable pretty reasonable results of it really so it's kind of quite nice that i've kind of gone from that nursing and actually managed to <laughs> make work the, the path i wanted to make work yeah of course cool. it's, it's a lot of thing it's something a lot of people don't think realize they have the power over in their own lives so just just want to clear something up we've talked about some fairly extreme athlete, athletic mm-hmm. kind of um clients and i know that you work with some professional footballers and other other kind of sportsmen but yeah is this something that that's available? I know the answer. I'm doing like the teacher. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Wibby, is yeah. this available to everyone, or do you have to be an extreme athlete? No, no, no. This is kind of. I mean, the work I do of the the athletes is actually like, in some ways, it's harder work because they the, what they do to their bodies is ridiculous. Mm. Um, but it's like this is. I mean, this is moving better and breathing better, like for everyone. Do you know what I mean? It's it's so it's so important. You've for just given everyone. me the, You just give me the title. Moving better and breathing better for everyone. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I think that is a pretty good conclusion. <laughs> so, so Wibby. Uh, sorry, Wibs. Whichever. Alex. Alex. Alex yeah. Do you find if someone calls Alex, you don't know, you don't know they're talking to you? No, I, I had to go as a nurse. I did have a couple of uh, like a couple of years where I was Alex, just because I I couldn't be asked to tell that story of like, <laughs> oh no, I'm Wibs. Why are you Wibs? Oh, because. My big problem. If people call me Andy, I genuinely don't know they're they're trying to get my attention. I, I, the I will, so, Andy, Andy. I will like, I will ignore them me. quite often. I will think that they're, they're probably talking to me, but and I'll just be like, I'm just, <laughs> but um, my little brother does that. Is is Andrew? But he's he's Drew, and he will just literally just blank you. He'll just I, got no interest in calling Andrew. But I just I don't know. They t- they might as well be shouting Rutiger or something. <laughs> I just it's not my name. Fred. Fred. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. so if people want to kind of learn more about what you do, I mean, you, you're very active. So I didn't give you a chance to answer then, did I? If people want to find out more about yeah. what you do, Wibby, how do they find you? Uh, so I guess if you are, most people are online these days because you're listening to this online. Um, on so social media, it's probably the easiest. On Instagram, I am Wib, W-I-B underscore yoga. And that's got my yoga. I, I basically post about yoga, breathing and anatomy and motion movement therapy on that um i've then got my facebook which is a ridiculous name uh it's called mandukya yoga um but that i don't really do a lot on that these days it basically is just everything you would see on instagram really um shared over to it and then my website is where all of my kind of i guess my 
in-depth one-to-one sort of information and stuff is kept, which is mandukiyoga.com. Um, can you spell that for us, please? I can. It's M-A-N-D-U-K. I'm literally typing it down. Y-A uh, yoga dot com. Cool. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of, that's pretty much where everything is for me online these days. I think that interests me. Um, and I do also work online. I'm doing, during COVID, I've had to, readjust and do online and in person well I'm now just starting to see people in person again but essentially for four months I've done everything online because I don't have to be hands on is literally what I was going to say absolutely what I was going to say I was <laughs> took say, the words out of your mouth the, the, the advantage now and, and for my work as, a, as an SEO consultant is now we're not limited to one geographical area everyone's kind of got over themselves with Zoom I think exactly and you know from my perspective I've been working with the footballers Mipswich Town throughout this whole lockdown period I've, when the physios weren't around and I've been working with just random clients and like PT clients who have, you know, PTs have sent me clients and PT. stuff. For, uh, personal trainer. Okay. Um, they've been, like, I've, I know a couple of people have sent me clients and just do it all online and they're like all over the country um, and we still get like unreal results because I don't have to be hands on and it's all about just moving better and as you just, you let the body move better and it just... It goes, oh, that's a nice way to be. So if you're listening to this, pretty much anywhere in the world, yeah. just just get in touch with Wibby. Uh, Wibs. Hit me up. Sorry, I can't do it. I can't call Wibby. It's right. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, well, thanks a lot for coming along. It's been, thanks it's for been, having me. You know, it's, it's been, been absolutely fascinating. I think We got a bit kind of carried away in the middle there, and we got kind of lost track of time a bit. It was good. That's good. No, it's yeah, just it talking about, it's, it's talking with passion. So yeah. as your journey develops, I think we'll have to get you back and I'll share let you know, some more learning. I'll let you know how my uh, free dive goes. If yeah, I come I back. hope to see you after if I come the back. Dive. When I when I come back, sorry. <laughs> oh God! If something happens, I've got to feel like. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to press the stop button now. Okay, I'm going to say goodbye. Do you want to say goodbye? Cheers, guys. Bye bye. This is a theme for Wibby. What does Wibby do? Hey, Wibby plays bass. Give us a bass. Oh yeah. Is that funky enough? Huh. It's a theme for Wibby. When we left school, you know what he did? He was a painter decorator. You know what noises painter decorators make? They have tin cans and brushes. You know what that sounds like? Like this. After we was a painter decorator, he was a nurse. You know what kind of noise nurses make? Nor do I. So here's a guitar. Wibby's theme. And Wibby left being a nurse. You know where he went? Huh. I'm not gonna tell you. I'm just gonna play the sound. You know where Wibby went? He went here, like. Huh. Huh. Wibby went to India. Swing with that sweet sitar. the end of this one so what do you think do you like it i hope so this is the kind of bit that you might be able to tell i just use the same bit every time because well it's not so much lazy as efficient but this is the bit where i say smash the like button or stab at it or actually just stroke it gently be nice you know why would you be so aggressive but please like please subscribe and please rank rate tell everyone this these kind of things i assume they matter everyone else says them but there you go so endeth this episode of the Andrew Culture Podcast. 
you want to know more about what I get up to, go have a look at andrewculture.com because I won't bore you with it here. Anyway, until the next time, keep it cool, stand in a dry place, um, or do what you want, I'm not your boss. Bye.